Good morning. Valuable learnings, the quest for the authentic student voice. I'm Jane Den Hollander, currently the Vice Chancellor of Murdoch University, taking another brief break from retirement. I speak to you from the lands of the Wajak Noongar people of Western Australia, and I pay respects to elders past, present and emerging, and those respects are extended to all Aboriginal people on the lands of this country, especially those listening and contributing today. I remind you all that land has never been ceded, nor shall it ever be. Welcome everyone. We have, we have, one, we have 58 minutes and it's a big topic. So let's get to business. The panel that you will have today are Ms. Monica Din, undergraduate student from UTS, Ms. Georgie Foley, postgraduate student from Curtin University, Lisa Bolton, the Director of Cult Research and Strategy at the Social Research Centre, and Dr. Caroline Rippett, Director, Student Success at Queensland University of Technology. I'll come back to them as we ask them to say what they have to say. But I want to say a few things. So how did we get here? We have nearly a thousand people on Zoom having a normal conversation in the back end of 2021. Whichever way you look at it, the pandemic has had an impact. And so too has our government and our sector. Our sector has been depleted of over a thousand staff, thousands of staff no longer work with us. Research projects have stopped and everyone, it seems, is worried about employment in an altered world. Our staff in our universities have had to contend with much, not least the three times alteration to the JobKeeper legislation to ensure that universities were not eligible. A shocking, debilitating message. And yet, and yet we know the success of vaccines, the advice of epidemiologists, of our medical people, of our nurses and of our policy makers, all educated in our system, all one students at a university somewhere. And this has enabled us as a nation to survive and thrive. Two full academic calendars have been consumed by the, by the pandemic and its complexities. All enrolled students in 2020 and 2021 have had their education altered. The experience was different. The first year classes are having an experience completely different to anything that any of us listening now could have imagined just two or three or four years ago. The languid days on lawns in Perth, chatting to friends in Melbourne, rushing to uni, from uni to work in Brisbane, planning overseas joints at every university campus in the country. Those days gone just for the moment. So what is the authentic student voice in late 2021 in Australia? The roaring 20s of the last millennium are as nothing to what we are likely to experience over this decade, 100 years later. Today, we're looking at what has changed, what has stayed the same, what has been our student experience? What do we wish to retain from this period? And there has been some astounding innovation on our campuses. And what, my friends, do we wish to leave in 2021 and not take with us in the hope and the ideas that we have for 22, 2022 and beyond as we bring back our resilience and thrive for the next decade ahead of us? So we're university people. We always start with the data. Our first speaker is Ms. Lisa Bolton, the Director of Quilt Research and Strategy from the Social Research Center. Lisa has some slides and she will take us through what the student experience is 2019 versus 2020. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Jane, for the lovely introduction. Um, hopefully you can all see the slides. We um, had a year of disruption in 2020. In the student experience survey, which is the survey of current undergrad and postgrad coursework students, we had a drop in the positive overall rating of the quality of the educational experience of nine percentage points. Now, this is a massive survey. And to shift the results in a survey like this is a bit like turning the Titanic. 
to get drops this big, something disruptive definitely happened. So we saw a nine percentage point drop for um, domestic students and a 12 percentage point drop from international students from a, from a lower base. International students have always rated their experience a little lower. And last year that dropped even further than for domestic, you can see in my, my little slide there. What we saw was the largest decline was in the learning engagement focus area. And I'll talk to you about um, what that means. And there were changes in learning resources, teaching quality and skills development. So I'll walk you through what those changes are and what we were hearing from the students. She says, hopefully, yes, I've gone with big text. I, I was frightened earlier. Um, so in terms of teaching quality, teaching uh, and the students' experience of, of teaching and learning is the biggest driver of their overall educational experience. I think everyone would agree. It's, this is not a surprise. But what we saw last year was that a, a number of these items that make up this focus area dropped, and they were mainly around the area of the structure of the course, um, just moving an on-campus unit into online space doesn't work. It is a different methodology, it is a different animal, and the course structures that work for on-campus don't necessarily work for online. The other thing we saw was that teaching staff, some teaching staff, were having trouble actively engaging students in that online space. They were used to the classroom where you get to look at people and engage with them and make eye contact, and suddenly they were in online space. Uh, a lot of what the students were saying were that just reading PowerPoint slides is not an engaging class. And a lot of academics just fell back onto that because effectively our systems were not ready, our staff were not ready, our students were not ready, and we didn't have the equipment and we didn't necessarily mm -hmm. have the skill set to deliver engagingly in that space. For the most part, people did a good job, but it was a problem. What we also saw was that institutions that had had less experience in online delivery, so institutions that in 2019 had only had about less than 20% of their delivery online, they had the biggest drops in overall experience, uh, educational experience. Um, but there was a big difference between institutions. It showed that while this was disruptive, some institutions handled that disruptive better than others. There are learnings to be had and there are messages to be heard about how to do this sort of um, online learning well. So another thing that we saw was around that learner engagement and, and those sorts of questions are asking a lot about student collaborative learning. It's asking a lot about how well students are engaging with other students, working with other students and engaging with them in class and outside class. And what we saw was that had the biggest drop of 16 percentage points in 2020. It's not as important to the overall experience as teaching and learning is, but it still had a little more importance last year, it took on a little bit more of the life of its own. What we saw that students were less likely to be working with other students. They were more likely to be having online discussions. So getting in Zoom into a room somewhere but they weren't engaging with other students. They weren't working with them. They weren't developing friendship groups, social groups. They weren't getting to know other students. And there was a lot of comment about students having to, to get into groups with other students and not knowing anyone. Who are you going to get in a group with? Who are you going to work with? Who are you going to see outside class time in order to, to, to help you both or help many of you through your studies? Um, and especially for international students, but for everyone, opportunities to interact with local students. International students have come from for an international experience and they were only engaging often with other international students. Now, that was true before COVID, but it was exacerbated after COVID. They were only engaging with other students, usually from their own language or cultural groups. The other thing we saw um, and we see for students who do online study is that they're less likely to report that they're developing their spoken communication and team building skills. So we see 
well, well, some people say, well, that's not important stuff. It's just about learning the material. If you're not engaging in these types of activities, often you're not developing some of the, well, some people would call soft skills around um, your educational practice. And so we see students who are studying online tend to develop those skills less. So how do we mitigate that in an online space? Um, in terms of learning resources, the, the nurses were beside themselves cross um, because they weren't getting the opportunity to apply their learning in this space. So online learning can make it much harder to apply your learning. They weren't getting to practice, she says, that's my injection hand, practice their skills on real people before they went out into the workforce at the end of their course. Students in science and maths engineering who, had, who were reliant on laboratories and those sorts of spaces. Students in fine arts who didn't have access to creative arts spaces and equipment were doing it tough. But international students were doing it tougher. International students have um, traditionally had more reliance on their campus. They rely more on the facilities on the campus for their social needs, their community needs. They don't have access to family and, and friendship networks often outside of their, of their university or, or higher education experience. So what we see is for international students, that, in, that learner engagement, that extra component of, of their experience, uh, access to libraries, access to learning spaces. I mean, we heard today about students, uh, particularly international students, having difficulty accessing um, uh, living spaces. They tend to be overcrowded. Those students tend to be isolated. We, we were letting our international students down because they just didn't have access. Um, what we saw was a huge increase in the number of international students saying that their financial circumstances, their living arrangements and their paid work commitments had a negative impact on their study. So not just on them personally, but on their study. And uh, some institutions um, had sort of programs to food banks where they were feeding their international students. Some institutions had a program where they would ring, staff members would ring all the international students just to see that they were okay because they were so isolated. So in a nutshell, that's the story from 2020 from the SES survey. That's what we heard students saying. These kinds of surveys are not everything. They don't collect everything. There are other aspects to the student experience that we're not covering, but certainly it's raised some important issues around um, teaching and learning in 2020. And we need to be listening to students about how to address those issues and how to improve our practice. Thanks. I think you're on mute, Jan. Sorry, I thought that was... What was the thing that it, um, surprised you the most from the data? You know the data going back years. What's the one thing that stunned you? I don't think any, I don't think I was stunned by anything. I think anyone who didn't see online learning coming kind of wasn't paying attention. But I think the big drops in some institutions was surprising. Um, mm. That a lot of institutions, the students were telling us, hadn't given them informational support on how to study online or yeah. how to collaborate online. Um, and I was also a bit surprised by just how hard the international students were doing it. They didn't have access to JobKeeper, JobSeeker, all of those financial supports that the domestic students had. And mm -hmm. in, a, in a slightly political comment, just telling them to go home really wasn't um, a solution. Yeah. We did not serve them well at that time. It wasn't our most generous moment. Thank you, Lisa. I'm now going to go to Monica. So, Monica, what was your what what do you recall from your experience as a as an undergraduate? particularly at the beginning and then now? Um, as an undergraduate, obviously it's been a big roller coaster. 
um, coming out of high school, it was, you know, everyone's super excited. I was super keen to be able to step into a new world, challenge myself, experience new things. And my first year of uni was amazing. I made so many friends. I was able to meet with so many people, expand my network, um, talk to tutors when I needed help. And they were readily there because we did have the opportunity to go to the classes and have face-to-face -face interactions. But um, obviously because of the COVID-19 situation, all of that has been taken away from us. Um, it is unforeseen, it's no one's fault, but that has had a very big impact on my experience as a student um, and especially coming from a science background. As Lisa said, we relied a lot on our um, laboratory work and all our experiments and to have to be at home and try to imagine that or kind of play out what would happen in an experiment in your mind and be able to write a scientific report based on that was very, very difficult. And, you know, our tutors would always be like, you know, you can collaborate with your friends, have Zoom meetings, but it's not the same online. It's very awkward to be able to pop online in a Zoom call and just establish that connection straight away. So I feel like a lot of us just shied away from even trying to ask for help because it was just too awkward to even do that. Yeah. Okay. So what has that done to your grades and your interest in your particular discipline? Um, in terms of grades, my grades have improved just because I've had a lot of time at home to be able to work on them. But in terms so there is a silver lining for parents. There is, in all yeah, the there things. is a silver lining. But in terms of my motivation for uni, um, it has just dropped significantly. I don't want to, like throughout lockdown, I wasn't passionate in medical science at all. And I really considered why I chose it in the first place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so right now, university study isn't all it was cracked up to be when you decided to, to make the big jump. No, no. And I, um, I just feel so bad for those who couldn't even experience anything. Like, at least I got to experience one, one whole year of, um, you know, uni life and societies. But I do have, like, my sister, she couldn't experience any of that and she's just lost all motivation at all. Yeah, the class yeah. of 21. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Georgie, who's a postgraduate student. So what's your experience been, Georgie, the sudden shift, shift to Zoom um, and coming out of an undergraduate into a postgraduate? Yeah, so I'd done both my undergraduate and the first half of my postgraduate fully internal. I'd never done any online study before. I'd always said, like, this is not for me. I would not be that person that does it online. Um, and our initial shift in that week where we decided we were going online was actually quite seamless. I think at my uni, all of the platforms were already in place. So it was a really easy shift onto the platforms. That was great. However, the classes were like put straight onto this online platform, exactly the same format, as Lisa said, as they were in an in an in-person classroom. And that is so different. Um, so like having mm. a 20-minute discussion with your peers in a classroom is incredible. And you have these amazing discussions and it goes so many places. But when you're on a Zoom and half the people in your breakout room don't have their cameras on and you have 20 minutes to have a discussion, you speak for about, I, I would speak and say something for about a minute, put it out to the group and no one would give me anything back and I would sit there for 18 minutes um, with nothing, to, no one to speak to, nothing to say. So I think that was really hard for me and I immediately just kind of was like, all right, this is not going to be the semester for me. I'm not going to participate anymore. I was immediately discouraged. And luckily I had an amazing tutor um, who had uh -huh. recognised me from before and knew that this wasn't how I interacted in a normal classroom setting and she gave me options. She said, try this, try um, the discussion board instead. She gave me the flexibility to do what would be suited for me and to just try a few different things to see what was suited for me. Obviously, I'd never done any sort of online work before, so she was like, try something new. The discussion board ended up being an amazing option for me that gave me the flexibility and the ability to have more nuanced discussions because you could go back and forth and I was still able to work and it was just like it gave me a really mm. awesome opportunity to thrive in online learning, whereas if I was just given that first um, Zoom platform, I would really um, struggle that year. So you had an intervention. How yeah. important was that to meet someone who thought about 
your learning needs in such a changed environment. Are staff important in this matter? It, staff is so important. I can't stress enough how important that tutor like, is to me. Like if I hadn't have had her in that moment, I would have immediately stopped going. I probably wouldn't have even um, like dropped out of the unit. I would have just tried to do the assignments off my own back and got a really bad mark. And so having tutors that actually listen to you, understand you and don't assume things about you um, is really important. And I think the value of these tutors, so many of these tutors have these feelings um, and are so understanding and so great. And I think their value in universities is very, very high and probably undervalued a little bit. <laughs> so you have a different view now you know, in our pandemic than you did of them before when you were you know, in a much different face-to-face -face environment. Yeah, 100%. I always, I always valued my tutors, but just the extent to which they cared about students and their um, students doing well really showed in the pandemic. So that was, mm -hmm. yeah. And so thinking of your lecturers, uh, the senior staff, how did they cope? Um, we're talking about the authentic student voice here. How was your view of how your, of your senior staff coped with the, the massive changes they had to deal with? Yeah, I think it was um, quite hard. A lot of my lectures were already um, online lectures and I think that they had done a really good job in the sense that no one took the easy route, in my experience, of just putting up an old recorded lecture, which I had a lot of friends experience and it was just like, what are we paying for if we're just going to have old lectures recycled? But mm -hmm. all of my... Um, senior staff who did the lectures they really put a lot of time and effort I could tell into making the lectures not the same as they were before it was obviously changed due to the context of COVID they were doing it no longer in a room but in their homes but you could mm. tell they were putting a lot of effort into it and it was like it was really um beneficial to us great thanks Judy let's go to Caroline now and Caroline the question for you is when we say authentic student experience what does this mean to you in your work in the support area of your university? I think, I think for me what the pandemic has really highlighted um, is that there is no um, single authentic student experience, but there are experiences. Mm -hmm. And when I think about that in terms of my role, it's really about saying, how do we better meet students where they're at? How do we more complexly understand their needs and understand that different student profiles are going to have different needs? And I actually think that that's always been the case. I think what the pandemic has done is really brought um, some of those needs much more to the surface. Um, the other thing I would note around an authentic student voice uh, and an authentic student experience is that it is actually everybody's responsibility. And I think the pandemic is requiring us to work really differently across our institutions. For our academics to be able to pivot and take risks, they need support. Um, they need support in terms of learning pedagogy, but they also need support in terms of their well-being. Um, and we need to think and tackle these challenges much more holistically. Um, so I think mm. those would be some of my thoughts just around. The yeah, yeah. Um, so, the so one of the questions that has come up just about everywhere when I've talked to people is how have universities been coping with students who have bad or no technology you know we all know about the MBN let's not have an MBN conversation but connectivity can be terrible um, often they don't have the best computers you know particularly new first years will often be using a hand-me-down or something how did this what did, what impact did this have did it make more people drop out or did you manage to get around those kind of support issues it, it's really interesting because um when we talk about the challenges of technology, uh, inevitably we yeah. can look at the hardware issues or do students have access to, to internet. Um, but I think, yeah. I actually think, I'm not sure that was the most um, uh, exacerbated pain point. It was actually all of the factors that were shaping when students were coming online, the fact that they had kids at home, the fact that um, they needed more flexibility um, around learning. Um, that to self-manage at home is a really different experience than to learn on campus where you have uh, cues, where you have community. 
And I actually think the challenges were less, uh, there were absolutely some challenges, but those are solvable potentially with, you know, at QT, for example, we were quite intentional about, okay, we need to make more computers available. Um, we actually sent students dongles. We could solve the hardware issues. It was the, the other things that were happening that were impacting students um, at home that was the greater challenge. And that's a much more complex piece. piece than so, it was so it was just business as usual then, because it's always the things at home and in your life that affect you in your learning. So nothing changed really, just, this, just the environment slightly. Is that your view? I think the environment changed, but I, but I think what's different with on campus is students have had often years of literacy around how to learn in an on-campus environment. I think what, what was missing is all of the, the learning literacies that was needed to work um, virtually. And that's, again, you can't just take your habits from on campus and assume that they're going to work um, at home. You've got to yeah. give it and, and learn and manage your learning very differently. And I think that's the, that's the challenge. Yep. Okay. What What about post pandemic? We're coming out of it now. This is going to end up being you know, uh, an experience that none of us want to go back to. What are the learnings you'll take from this period? And then, what's the one thing you will never want to do again? Well, I'm actually, although it's been hard and it's been tiring, um, so I, I am looking forward to a little bit of sleep, um, a little bit more sleep, I think we all are, but I think the thing that I take away is the pandemic has really accelerated um, digital disruption across universities, and yeah. there is no going back. Being able to now um, support students in much more blended and agile ways, and I think it's also meant we've had to listen much more deeply to the students. Um, yeah. And for me, the, the solution is to work in partnership with students um, to find ways of designing learning environments that are more fit for purpose for the future. So if anything, it, it, it's highlighted pain points. It hasn't been easy, but I've also been really struck by how resilient students are um, and also how resilient our staff uh, is. And even though we've, it's been pretty hard with institutions, I've, I've also found it really inspiring about how institutions have found a way forward. Um, so so are, you, are you sharing across the sector? Is there, you know, are we doing what we should do? I've retired now, so I'm not quite connected. Are we sharing everything, the, the, you know, the good bits, the bad bits, getting communities of practice going of how to do it better? Uh, absolutely. In my, yes. And I, and I think um, that that's actually um, accelerated and, and become much deeper. Um, the fact that you know, I'm in Brisbane, I'm, I'm on the pipeline to UQ and, and to Griffith talking to them about how are you handling this? This is how I'm handling it. So absolutely. And I think, um, and I think that, again, really highlights the importance of professional development conferences and creating spaces of collaboration and learning. But again, I think students need to be part of that conversation for us to really um, find ways forward. Thank you, Caroline. So Monica, you've heard some of that. Um, what do you wish you could have back? now that we're coming out of the pandemic, you know, you were here before, you had, you know, the, the idyllic student life in Australia, you know, lying on the grass, socialising and a bit of learning. What do you wish you had back after the experience? I, um, I think for me personally, I just want to be, be having those conversations again with like-minded people in my course. Um, it's not even going back to uni and having that same learning experience. I just want to be surrounded by people who, um, you know, do medical science because they're passionate. And I want to be able to have those conversations and share my thoughts with them because I feel like during lockdown, I was just completely um, unmotivated. And because I wasn't surrounded by those like-minded people, I wasn't able to spark my interest again. And I wasn't be able, like, I wasn't able to grow, um, personally in my studies yeah so what could we do to help with that what have you got any ideas of how we how university administrators teachers professional staff could help with that I think maybe when coming back to uni um have more group-based activities so that we can we're able to like uh, take back that time that we lost um even though it's like even if it's just it doesn't have to be completely uni related or study related. It can't just be um, something that sparks interest, sparks conversations between different people, because I feel like that's that's what we really need at the moment, because we did lose a lot of that social interaction um, throughout lockdown. Mm, OK, interesting. And then going to you, Georgie, at the postgraduate level, what were the positives? What won't you miss? 
The positives, I think the biggest positive that came out of it for me was the flexibility and the options that this pandemic allowed us to have. I know there was the option of online before, but the classes, it was always, it seemed to me like a a kind of a second option that you do when you really can't go on campus. And I remember I would have a couple of work days that were set for me. And if I had a uni class that fell on those days, I would have to take a day off work to be able to go to that class whereas now having the opportunity to be able to do an on class online class that I know is going to be of a really high standard is awesome and that also for me like it's just work for me but for so many students who have accessibility problems or who Mm. are not able to get onto campus all the time or who maybe are able to come onto campus sometimes but not other times having the options to be able to come online sometimes in class sometimes and not fall behind I think that is a huge positive that's come out of it for me yeah so so looking forward now do you see that that's how the world is going to be that that students will want those options they want a bit of flexibility sometimes I'll come online because I've got to go to work and other times I'd like to be face to face how do you see that playing out for the next generation yeah I think that's going to be a a massive part of uni from now on I think it's going to be not so much you choose an online class or you choose a on in-campus class at the start of the semester and you have to stick to that. I think it should, going forward, there should be the option to be able to go between. And as long as you are aware and your tutor or unit coordinator are aware of this happening, I think that would be a really important thing, especially with people now being so much aware, more aware of doing things when you're sick. Like I remember I used to yeah. go to work and go to uni when I was sick all the time and now I won't leave the home. So I think having that and not having to disclose why you're not coming to class or disclose why you want to do it online this week, I think that's a big part as well because maybe you don't have a reason that you want to tell someone. So that's a positive, isn't it? Um, Accessibility is definitely a positive. Yeah. Yeah. So going back to Lisa then. So, Lisa, you look at the data. So how do you think this will play out next time? Are you, where do you expect things to improve? You know, accessibility, George has just been saying, was more convenient at, part, at various times in her life to be able to go online. And if you think of all our students with access issues of various kinds, do you see that improving, changing? I think this kind of survey um, is measuring how we're performing against student expectations. And I think one of the things that will change in 2021 is that the students' expectations will change. And Mm -hmm. so we'll see some improvement just by dint of that. Some institutions have done a lot of work. One one institution I know has redesigned every unit to be able to be delivered online or on campus. Other institutions are just saying la-la and hoping it'll go away. Um, I think that what will be needed is to identify what is the... What is the intrinsic thing that brings students to campus? So I think even before COVID, students were voting with their feet and not turning up to campus outside class times. Um, They were still coming to classes and valuing that, but outside class, there wasn't a lot of impetus, a lot of activity, a lot of structured things that students found valuable. So I think the conversation that would be most valuable in, in this next year would be what is it about the on-campus experience that is valuable? What is it about on-campus delivery of education that is valuable? And what can we do online without losing what students would consider to be quality? And so I think think those are the conversations maybe that that we should be having because um, we'll, we'll have some improvement in 2021 but it's mm-hmm. not going back. It won't. It won't land pre, pre twenty twenty yet. Okay. Another thing that occurred to me is it easier to drop out online. You know, often on campus you can persuade students and intervene on a bad day. You know, I've had enough of this. I've just failed a unit. Or come and chat to someone. Is it easier online? Dropping out. I think in in some ways, yes, (laughs) absolutely, it's easier um, to drop out. But again, I think one of the strongest tools we have to counter that is to design connection and engagement into our online learner experiences much more um, intentionally. And 
um, to make sure that we're understanding much earlier um, how students are tracking. And we don't need to wait until they're in crisis before we reach out. I think there's been some really exciting students as partners work across, which is let's be proactive in understanding what the needs are. Um, and mm. in involving students in the conversation, we also can create better help seeking cultures on campus um, and online um, so that again, there's nudges and um, we support students that they're not on their own um, when they're at home in their, in their bedroom or in their office, um, that we're there with them, supporting them. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um, last question before we go to our audience, and Claire Mackin's probably looking at a few of the questions for us. So, Caroline, this exhaustion thing, you know, it's the age, you know, the big exhaustion I heard on the radio this morning. It is true, isn't it? Everyone is tired, especially in our sector. It is, but I think what one of the tools we have to counter that is partnership. Um, because when we face complex problems, whether they're problems of learning, when we're in it together and we have a range of different perspectives, that's what leads to the innovative solutions. And I think more than ever before, universities need to work in much more integrated ways, the academic, the professional staff member, the student, uh, the data specialist, we need to all be working. So we have to change the ways, the ways we work the way we work probably and and I think that's going to then also help us um breathe more um and also feel like we're not all in it alone and that we don't have to I think a lot of people are feeling they have to carry a lot on their shoulders we need to think about how we can share that load um across okay all right Claire what's the most popular question we've we've had from our thousand strong audience Excellent. It's actually the chat is going off. So thank you. I'm loving the chat. And um, I've actually grouped four themes from the chat. So there's a little bit of back and forth of observations and a couple of formal questions. So I'm going to summarize for you, Professor Den Hollander, um, four questions for the panel. So one, one is around what have we learned from online learning through COVID for traditional on-campus students? The second is, and I'm going to give you a bit more detail, so hold on. Um, when do we want to have fully online learning? And the third one is a bit of chat around the access and equity issue. So what has COVID meant for access and equity? And the fourth is um, quite early on some questions around whether big institutions are more agile, non go 8 and what about private providers and non-universities as well? So just to give you a bit of a flavour of what's happening mm -hmm. on the chat is, um, you know, some one of the key questions um, from Dr Cook, what are some practical solutions or advice for engaging students in online synchronous settings, um, especially in terms of convincing them to participate in the first place? And I think a lot of the chat participants um, are reflecting on the fact that students aren't turning on cameras um, and it's a very difficult place to engage. And one student has written, my first year of uni was in 2020. It was such a shock to the system. Online classes were definitely awkward and many students dropped out of the course as soon as the online classes started. So I might give you this question first and come back to me for the next, but what are some really practical solutions for engaging students in online synchronous settings? Okay, Monica. Um, I think... With that, it is very hard to get a student to be motivated and to participate, especially when they're so comfortable in their homes. Um, I found that even myself, like I would have a class at 9 a.m. And if I was on campus, I would be there ready at 9 a.m., present and excited. Because you're so comfortable at home, I'll be in bed. You know, and it's very hard to be able to push someone to um, be motivated and um, participate in a class. I think with that, tutors just have to be very understanding and not expect you to always be on top of your game every single class. Um, I found that with me, some tutors were really good at um, being able to understand that and um, help you get back on track. But I feel like for some of my other classes, the tutors will just be like, come on, guys, I need you guys to, um, you know, participate now. Like, you guys need to turn on your cameras. And sometimes it was like I felt like I wasn't being, um, like, understood or, like, mm -hmm. students weren't being Not heard. being heard. Yeah. Not being heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you think that – so thinking about that, you're not a fan of going fully online, are you, that the future will be fully online? So how are we going to motivate you to get up at nine o'clock? What, 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 what are the changes you'd like to see so that you are motivated? I think um, first, 
just for the tutor to be someone who is excited and very passionate about what they do because our students we can see that and if we're being taught by someone who is so passionate that will ignite something in us to want to be able to attend the classes um, and just maybe trying to have activities that are not just breakout rooms yeah. because breakout rooms are sometimes so awkward um, yeah so yeah that does sound awkward what about you Georgie what do you think of that how do you how do you get enthusiastic to you know switch on your camera yeah I think that I mean, what works for me might not work for other people, but I think for students, all of our students are so different and a one size fits all isn't ever going to work. Um, like, uh, But I do think that as tutors or as institutions, it's like being creative and trying new things. Like it might not work, try, you know, a funny activity at the start. In class, I normally hate doing those like icebreaker things, but on a Zoom... <laughs> you kind of have the confidence of not actually being in front of everyone. And so doing these icebreakers in front of a whole class on a Zoom, things like that, I think can really help get people yeah. engaged, get people laughing, get people happy to be in the class and then get onto the more content of the course. I think that's a great way to get people engaged and on their cameras. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, Caroline, um, what are you giving, what are the tips that you give to to academic staff, many of whom have worked in the sector their whole lives in another way, you know, 40 years, excellent class teacher. How are you enabling them to become technocrats and use the system? You know, it's like a like the front of an aeroplane sometimes, you know, starting to jiggle things when you've got 100, 200 students. Where are you, how, how is the sector doing on training and helping teachers? I think that um, probably that's an area we can keep um, keep growing. Um, and I think sometimes it's about, okay, what are, what are the new tools we can use? And it often becomes a tool or technology conversation when I actually think it needs to be more of an experience um, conversation. So, you know, one of the things um, when I'm talking um, to academics about facilitating student success in the classroom, it's about how do you intentionally build a positive help-seeking uh, culture in the classroom? How do you intentionally build personalization and connection. I know it sounds simple, but something as simple as the academic has a story of their own journey as learners. Um, mm. Sometimes it's not a technology solution. Sometimes it's about sharing um, uh, their own insights or reflections on learning. Okay. Uh, sometimes it, it's, it's about sending an email and making it personal. Um, but another thing that I've seen that's really powerful is we have a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning in our universities and a lot of really robust peer programs. What I have seen at QUT is some of our academics have actually brought those peer programs from the co-curricular space into the curriculum. And again, that, that mm. has been quite powerful. That's a big win, actually. Mm. So, Lisa, what about um, large universities versus small universities? Um, do the large ones cope better with going digital vis-a-vis -vis -vis small, or is it absolutely not like that at all there was a question well some of that is about turning the titanic so some of the large institutions were caught short they'd had very little online delivery prior to 2020 and they had to not only sell it to their students but sell it to their staff because their staff didn't want to deliver and teach mm -hmm. in an online environment let alone the students not wanting mm -hmm. to learn that way and mm -hmm. so i think uh, for a lot of big institutions that that hadn't had that experience previously, it was a very sharp and very ugly learning curve. Um, but mm. for some of the smaller institutions, it was a non-university that rewrote every subject to mm. ensure that it was it was sort of a valid delivery yeah, method yeah. for online or on campus. So they were very nimble and put in that that resource and really pushed it but some smaller ones. Yeah. So going then from Georgie's question about how she likes the flexibility of Zoom, you know, Zooming in or going in and how she does that, Monica said similar things. What's the message from that for our sector? We, we asked students for some institutions that added extra questions about how much support and information they had received from their institution on how to learn online and how to collaborate online. And less than half of them said that they'd had any. Like uh -huh. there was, it, it was a problem because there is an assumption that an online learning experience is the same 
as an on-campus one and it just isn't. And so with my teaching, my previous teaching hat on, I would say that what we are looking at is teaching staff how to deliver online. What we need is learning design around Mm -hmm. how to have conversations in an online space, how to engage in an online space, how to be social in an online space. And I think both staff and students are not necessarily there yet. This is a big learning curve. And but so then, that's part of induction going forward, do you think, yes, at the beginning I of first so. year for I staff and so. students? I know one institution um, had, with which I used to be associated um, has a whole unit at the beginning of their online courses called Learning and Teaching Online where they get the, the, the whole purpose of that unit is to teach students those skills about how to do group work online, for example, by actually setting tasks. So to a large degree, and to Monica's point, you need to set tasks that for, force students to engage, that, that they are made to engage and be seen to be engaging, and that that's part of the actual curriculum. Don't and just the throw a question out there. There is something, you know, there's, there's, you've got some skin in the game. Yeah. So, do, you anyway. agree, do you agree with that, Monica? Yeah, I do for sure. Um, sometimes we would be put into a breakout room just to discuss and we're all like, mm, so, you know, we'll say like one, <laughs> one comment, two comments, and that's it. Mm, yeah. yeah. So we should, Georgie? Yeah. 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 Georgie? Yeah, I agree as well. I find the classes of mine that have really excelled in the online world is like the ones where you aren't just online for the sake of being online you have little requisites that you have to meet to be able to get the grade like participation grades I guess is okay online yeah. let's go back to Claire Claire have you got a couple of other questions for us for this last last few minutes yes definitely I think that there was a lot of chat around the benefits of online learning, particularly for some students who would require that and at different levels, such as postgraduate. So um, some of the comments were that, you know, why do you assume we're going back to the previous forms? Many institutions will remain online and is the pandemic over? Europe doesn't suggest so. Um, Another comment, we need to remember that online is the authentic workplace for many careers. Important to note disciplinary difference and shifts towards digital delivery. So I suppose what's the future um, in terms of online learning and how do we position that moving forward? Yeah. Okay. And so, Georgie, thinking about the, the, you know, the rest of your studies and peers coming through, how do you see that future playing out? What would you like improved in the online experience that you've had? I think an improvement really just has to be understanding the diverse needs of the student and I think that that can only really be found through talking to the students and asking them what they need and having a broad range of students not just talking to one class Mm. of art students or talking to people from everywhere from every background Um, and I think it's important as well like I know a lot of students you get the emails about doing surveys and um, things like that and you often see a lot of them come through and it's just like I can't be bothered I don't have the time is it really going to do anything this is going to make no change at all like they that's what I often think I still do them but I do think that a lot of people have that thought and so I think if you're doing it in classrooms in zooms if it's online and having conversations where someone is note-taking and actually listening to what students want I think that's really important that's a better way Yeah, I like the question about, you know, this life after study, so careers. And the reality is you are going to be living, doing and working as we are speaking now. Yeah. Does that excite you? I mean, it excites me in a way. Like the the amount of people you're able to meet is a lot more. um, you You have so many more opportunities online that you might not have had in person but then obviously there is a lot that you miss out on traveling and meeting people in person is such an interesting experience as well so I think that obviously we will have to get used to this and this is our maybe new normal but yeah there is I think there's a lot of benefits to online but there's still the in-person things that I personally will miss Mm. miss doing. So Monica are you actively looking for work yet? Um, not in my field, no, because I 
do want to do further study. Um, yeah, just lockdown has really made me realize what I want to do with my career. Um, so not yet in my field. Okay. All right. Um, another question, Claire. We've probably got time for three more. Excellent. I think this one's quite a, a big one. So, you know, thank you to the presenters for this valuable discussion. I'm curious whether anyone has found that with while the shift to online teaching has raised many significant challenges, one benefit is increasing access to university education from a more diverse range of students, for example, in regional and remote in Australia. And just for the so the other side is in the UK, we've had substantial areas with poor network connections and that has made online engagement very difficult and having the camera on really exacerbates that challenge. Does Australia have the same issue? And then sort of the other, just to give you a lot to talk about, um, the whole interaction between international and local students um, at the postgraduate level. So local students were typically studying online at postgrad and internationals on campus, so it really split. So now that they're coming together, that mix, how, how has that changed the landscape? So lots of questions around access and equity. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go with that first one about access. So collectivity, um, I've read some of the British press and, and the irritations there, and I must admit I was surprised. I thought we, you know, we took the prize for bad MBN, but I don't think that is the case. So how are we feeling? Lisa, did you get any comments in the survey around connectivity and the annoyance of a camera all the time? Uh, some, some, particularly with institutions where the staff didn't have either computers or connectivity, um, let alone the students. So certainly there were those teething problems, but it probably mm. wasn't as big an issue as some would think. A lot of students were able to still come onto the campus in a COVID safe kind of way and access wireless networks and access some equipment through libraries and stuff. It was that in a group with 30 people that, that was mm. really um, lost. Yeah, and the cost of it all, was that a, a, an SE, a socioeconomic problem anyway? You know, I mean, going online with camera for five hours a day is quite expensive. Uh, not that I could get out of the surveys. Okay, not out of the you surveys. Get anecdotally, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Monica, any of your friends complain about that? Um, not my friends, but personally for me, just... Um, internet issues sometimes which is you know it happens to everyone but then that sometimes would affect my grade um because you uh -huh. know if in the middle of a quiz and your internet drops you're gonna have to do that whole quiz again with completely new questions and uh -huh. sometimes the tutors would be if it happens more than once or twice they'll be like you know what's happening there and it's not yeah. like I want it to happen it just sometimes it happens there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that is it yeah that is an issue so, Caroline, um, this improved access from regional and remote. Are you seeing that? Um, are the regions do the regions have enough connectivity and bandwidth to have the kind of conversation we're having now? I think I think that's still an area probably that universities need to be paying a significant amount of attention to. Um, one of the things I find interesting is how the conversation plays out, because if the problem is learning design. Um, then we can improve the learning design, but does that actually solve the problem? I think the other bit around access is really looking at it in a much more systems, uh, in a much deeper way. So looking at, do you have systems integration? Because that's often a barrier um, to students. Do your policies, when a student gets disrupted in a, in a quiz, do you have policies that are agile enough to actually respond to, uh, to those scenarios. So I think part of, for me, Jane, the access conversation is not just looking at the at surface level of the learner design, but actually looking at your systems, your structures, your policies, and we're going to have to rethink. And again, that's not new. Marsha Devlin was talking about that five years ago. Yeah, that's it's not right. enough just to tweak things. Sometimes you actually have to build from the ground up. And we're seeing that a lot now with universities changing course progression, changing how students can consume their learning. All of that has to be also part of the conversation if you want to improve um, access for regional and remote and uh, other, other cohorts. And my view is that's the great silver lining of this, this thing we've just endured and may continue to endure, is that we have to rethink some of the age-old customs of a, of a sector that knows how to do things, and we now need to do them differently and better. I want to go... There is some interesting work around regional hubs, um, which are there 
to, to offset that isolation of regional and remote students studying online. Um, and so that idea of a learning hub, which takes on that social community, those kind of intangibles outside the learning, um, there's work being done around that and they were using some quilt data around it, which should prove very interesting. Yeah, okay, that'll be useful to see. Um, finally, let's talk about the library, you know, the centre where boy meets girl, girl meets girl, boy meets boy. Certainly that's where I met my husband. Um, library stayed open. How important was the library to all of you? Monica? Um my local library was closed and um, due to um, like living in a Western suburb, I wasn't able to make my way up to uni because of um, travel restrictions. So I didn't access the library at all throughout lockdown. Um, it wasn't really prominent in my study throughout that time. Georgie? Yeah, well, I'm in WA, so we didn't have too long of lockdowns, which is lucky. So during my lockdowns, I didn't use the library. However, after we were able to go back to campus, I wanted to go to the library so much more because, you know, that is such a place where, like, if you're going to feel what university is like, it's in the library. So I remember after um, I went back onto campus, I was going to the library so much more than I was previously just to get that sort of feel of being back at uni. Mm. Were, were they, was the library crowded? Were you one of many or was it just you? One of many. I think lots of people had similar ideas. And it's just, yeah, just like the vibrancy and being able to be around people. I think people miss that a lot. So being able to do that in that setting was really important for people. All right. We're running out of time. We've run out of time, actually. They're going to cut us off in a minute and a half. So I'll sum up. We have a postgraduate and undergraduate students who've changed, had to live with change, are taking some of the things, positives with them are both looking bright-eyed and cheerful. Caroline, you need a rest because you've had a very busy time. And Lisa, we look forward to new data next year to see the difference, particularly, I think, 2019 to 2021. And to our great audience, I'm sorry we haven't got to all of your questions. Um, I'm sure Claire will collate lots of it. I know Texa will closely scrutinise all those questions, and we look forward to the great summaries. Um, to all of my panellists, thank you so very much for being so authentic, particularly our students, you make us proud. And I will hand back to our presenter and say a very good afternoon to everyone around Australia. Texa, well done. A thousand people in the room somewhere across our great land is some achievement. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you, Professor Dan Hollander, and to the panellists as well, Monica, Georgie, Lisa and Carolyn. That was absolutely fantastic. And I loved hearing about the experiences during COVID. I love the chat of people as well, sharing a lot of experiences and a lot of views and comments on this topic. It's so important. Uh, we're about to move on to the next panel, and I'm actually going to chair the next panel. It's going to be um, fantastic as well. I just know it. And uh, we're just stay where you are. We're going to get the panellists in the room. We'll be back with you in just a minute.